about the fact that when they escape, all too often the judge turns around and gives the kids back to the father, even though he is a known felon, and we both know that. In that cockamamie uh, uh, doctrine of, uh, of Mormon dogma, that, that they, they've got this thing where it says that a, there should not be a year past that a child is not born into uh, the covenant of right. polygamy crap. Well, so wasn't that crap? A lot of these poor women, they have to get pregnant every freaking year because some dumb husband takes that, that that, that means that eh, he's supposed to have all his women dropping a kid every year. Uh, that's funny. Uh, I knew birth control was a sin long before I knew what it was. <laughs> the way we grew up. <laughs> well, I hate to tell you my answer. Gosh, when I was looking at this thing of, of these kids in Africa and these little 12 and 13 year old girls having babies and I come up off the couch and I shouted at the TV and I says, where is the green Cheerios? They're a little elastic that you put on the little lamb's nuts. Right. You know, little goats. <laughs> put them on them little boys <laughs> to where they can't be doing that to all them little girls. It's more than insane because the dual standard which is almost everywhere. The dual standard makes a man a big, hurrah, glorious, powerful Yahoo God, the more sex he has. When I was a little kid, I remember dad bragging and saying, what a man I am, what a man I am. And he's counting all of his kids and he can't even remember all their names, but it's what a man I am because I had all these kids. And when he left, I was nine, I think. I asked my mama. I said, Mama, didn't that old tomcat out there, isn't he the father of most of the kittens in the neighborhood? Mama said, yes, he certainly is. I said, but Mama, he's not a man yet. <laughs> I got slapped so hard, it almost knocked me off my feet. But I'll never forget it because I didn't know why she hit me. But then I realized that I had verbalized an inconvenient truth. You most and, certainly had. And I never forgot it. Right. Daddy wasn't a man yet. He was just a tomcat. But he couldn't be convinced and nobody could say it. Why is it that so many men don't have a godly disposition and all they can do is think through their little head? Because they, that breeding makes them a god they're going to have enough posterity to people their own earth now that is why fumarous disease which is a disease caused from interbreeding is the highest in the world in fundamentalist mormon polygamous cults oh i believe it it really is and it's where they come up with all these freaky uh malfunctions of the body uh, uh cleft foot and and, uh, uh, you know, uh, born without body parts and stuff. And some are so dang deformed that they, 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 they don't even live. And they're just a hole that's dug in the backyard and they're laid to rest. Well, that's, that's the whole thing. Lena Erickson about that. She's the one that was telling me all about that in the Kingston group. Because they really have been breeding. Well, down in Colorado City, they have a whole graveyard of babies. All these babies without records and everything that were born, they're just buried there. And if they die, oh well. But if they live, at least they're another welfare check. And I've actually heard women yeah. cry and say, I only hope that this child is going to be whole. And then the consolation is, well, even if the child isn't whole, it's another welfare check, and that's a gift from God. Now, these men that breed women like cattle for the welfare check and have free labor of their sons and little girls to use as a commodity or sell or whatever they want to do, I fully believe that the government should help them out so that the women don't suffer worse than they do. But I also believe the government should go in, literally, and find out these men's investments that they've made in the name of a church, in the name of a corporation, in the name of any business ranch, etc., that they're hiding in the name of a church or any other name so that the law can't touch them.
And I think they should do DNA testing. There should be a legal limit to how many kids a man can spawn without having his kingdoms ripped apart, his financial empires ripped apart, no matter what name they're held in, and pay that back to the government. And if they did that, Keziah, polygamy oh, yeah. would shrink, shrink, shrink. Oh, the Kingstons, that would just... Uh, that would uh, cut their little red wagon off. The Kingstons are extremely wealthy. Well, they are. That's what I'm saying. Several are known for violent crimes that they've committed, mostly on women. And yet they give their kids back to those same men that have a criminal record when the women escape. Because they have the money. <clears throat> and that's the American way, and especially is it the American way in Utah. We can name many cases like that. They're not an island. You know, and then they'll sit there and, and uh, rob coppers from the welfare of the U.S. government. I was going to say, do you know why they do it? Because they can. Amen. And do you know why polygamy is increasing? Because they can. Do you know why more women are losing their rights? Well, that's what the Lost Boys of Short Creek is about. Well, my brothers went to work were free labor for God until they got old enough to be a competition for the women. And then they were basically, Roger was run off. Dad beat him with a two before so hard, Luke Kelch had to step in to prevent him from killing him. Now, who's your mother's brothers? Owen Allred and Rulin Allred. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you be. Yeah, sure, sure. Now, step into Cody and his wives. His wife, Christine, is my cousin. Now, I've got female relatives in every single polygamous group I know that is white or claims and blames Mormonism. All of them. All of them. Somebody sent me a picture of 57 of Warren Young's young wives, and all except one of them was in the genealogy books on my mother's side of our family. And the other one was a little Zitting girl, and Dad served time in the Utah State Pen with Charles Zitting in 1945. Mm -hmm. They said for polygamy but it wasn't for polygamy. Every one of those men in there had a child bride or had trafficked a Ooh, child across sex. the border for sex. Yeah, we was taught that these is a priest and brethren. Right. See, this is why in the opening of my book, I say, of course I use colorful language. Hell, who wouldn't? Polygamy in itself is a kick in the gut. Being, uh, listening to priesthood brethren that are like white and sepulchers full of dead man's bones. Yes, ma'am. That's them. That's them. Yes. That's uh, them. Uh, Leroy Johnson, uh, Warren Jeffs, Ruland Jeffs, Carl Holmes, uh, Guy Musser, uh, the whole nine yards of those false prophets. They're sick. Polygamy is based on greed, not God. Polygamy is based on narcissistic power, not holiness. Money, polygamy, power, and polygamy sex. Polygamy is a form of enslavement that these men themselves would never tolerate if it were reversed. Amen. And that fact alone, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, they take their little brand of religion and they say, God this and God that. I say, hey, listen, I believe in God but you better spell it with two O's. And they say, well, it's good for somebody. No, it's not. If it's, if it's not good for the human race, it's not good, period. It, it, it isn't, greed is not okay because it's good for one person. It's not okay at all, period, over and out. That's a crock. Yep, it is. And when I am a less of a human being because I'm female or black or Hispanic or anything, from another country, from another thought consciousness, wrong. Yep. That judgment is always, always, always wrong. It's not our place to judge people. It's our place to love them, to help them, and to uplift them. Not to tear them down because we don't happen to... Uh, well, we really tear them down because we want to be better than them. Let's get real. That's the only purpose to, there is to it. Money, power, and sex. That's exactly. 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 He, he who has the gold makes the rules. Yeah, yeah. He most, can, like a game. card game. He who has the most money wins. Trouble is, Keziah, none of us are playing with a full deck in this card game. 
<laughs> yeah, well, as I like to say, uh, they're, they're not just a couple of bricks short of a load. They're a whole empty truck. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. What would you like to say in summary of why women don't leave? Well, for one thing, it's the fear of damnation. Right. Because they've never been taught that they have the ability to think for themselves. It's the fear of leaving the family members who they have come to love naturally. And, and, uh, and it's the, the fear of the uh, Gentile, Gentile world that we have been taught is so wicked. Gosh, when I left that wretched mess and I started, I, I refused to look at a person, where is your religious background? Brother, if I dare uh, talk to you or walk with you, or do business with you, I would look at a person and say, this is one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to treat you the way I'd want to be treated, and I appreciate if you treat me the same. Let's just, just do business on one-on-one -on -one with respect. And you know, gosh, all the wonderful people that I met that I was told is devils. That's right. If You, you know, <laughs> the mark of a quality person is integrity, not the club they belong to. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's right. Thank you so much, Keziah. Thank you. You're wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate your being on your show. Dr. Rulin Clark Allred was the head of the second largest polygamist group in the United States that claimed or blamed fundamentalist Mormonism. Dr. Allred was my mother's brother. He was the head of the Apostolic United Brethren, which I grew up in, also known as the Allred Group. Dr. Allred was gunned down in his Murray, Utah office on the order of a rival cult leader and polygamous leader, Ervil LeBaron. Ervil LeBaron ordered his blood atonement because Uncle Rulin had refused to buckle down and give him the power. Ervil was responsible for nearly 30 murders, according to Wikipedia. Some now say there were approximately 40 that they didn't find all the bodies. Many books were written about this. John Krakauer's Under the Banner of Heaven was probably the most popular. This mass murderer was my brother-in-law's brother. Owen Allred, another one of my mother's brothers, became the head of the AUB and he was found guilty of embezzling $1.4 million from Virginia Hill. His entire priesthood council knew about this. The evidence of that recorded priesthood meeting is what found him guilty. He had to pay it back through his parishioners, which they basically inherited the bill. Of course, they were his sheep. He fleeced them. This is a video of the entire story of the by investigative reporter John L. Llewellyn. On the Sister Wives blog, you will see that the current leader is Lynn Thompson. He's the leader now of the AUB, and he has been accused of molesting his own daughter, and according to many reports, has a lot to substantiate this. His father was found guilty of child molest as well, why do I know this? Because his father was married to one of my sisters. Many of you are unaware of the fact that Cody Brown of Sister Wives is a member of the AUB. Cody and I share maternal grandfather and his wife Christine is my cousin. All of us were raised to believe in the teachings of the AUB which means that polygamy was a commandment, not a choice. And if we chose not to obey it, we would suffer eternal damnation. This reality show is anything but reality on the fundamental doctrines of our belief system. We were also raised to be extremely racial prejudice. These quotes from the Book of Mormon say that if the people will keep their promises and their faithfulness, those that have dark skin will become white and delightsome. Racial prejudice is a built-in part of fundamentalist Mormonism. And Cody Brown belongs to the AUB, a fundamentalist Mormon polygamist group.
These facts can be confirmed by research on the internet. Fundamentalist Mormonism would never have given the blacks priesthood. They didn't believe in it. Look at this. The AUB believes that blacks should never have been given the priesthood. These people are my family. This is what enslaved me, and this is what the public needs to know. Welcome to our show tonight, Polygamy, What Love Is This? We appreciate you inviting us into your homes. My name is Doris Hansen, the host uh, for the program, and this is a talk show focused on the topic of polygamy. Welcome to our show tonight, Rebecca Kimball. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for inviting me. You, you were born and raised in Utah, but now you are living in the Eureka, California area. That's correct. Okay. Uh, you have a very deep and a passionate interest in the efforts of what we're doing here to inform our viewers about the truths of polygamy. And that's what we're going to do tonight. Indeed, I do. <laughs> Indeed, I do. <laughs> so let's talk a few minutes about your experiences of being born and raised in a polygamy group. First of all, tell our viewers where you were born, which group that you were born in, and, and tell us a little bit about your family life as you were growing up. I was born and raised in the AUB group. My mother was an all red. Uh -huh. And my father was an independent. And uh, my father remained an independent, but I was raised in all red. So I was raised in the AUB. I am one of 39 children born to my father's six wives. I'm among the 31 that he claimed as his own. Hmm. We we're regimentally trained from the moment of our birth in blind obedience mm -hmm. and complete dedicated servitude. My mother, like other polygamist women, was in bondage to fear, mm -hmm. control, and the blind obedience to a bloodthirsty and angry God that we were taught to believe in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I grew up in extreme poverty. The psychological and emotional needs of women were something that were considered a sin and that they were meant to overcome. Mm -hmm. In other words, their needs, any needs, physically, emotionally, financially, intellectually, educationally, were considered weaknesses to overcome. And I do mean even the use of their brain. It was not allowed. My father always had the first word, the last word and all those in between. When I was a little girl, when my father was in prison, his youngest wife, Rachel, escaped with her five children. She died shortly after in an airplane crash. The state of Utah let my father out of prison and gave him back those five children that she had escaped with hmm. on his promise that he would never live polygamy. Of course, he took two more wives after that. And those children were raised to believe what he taught us all. He would gather us in the family and he would say, the finger of God struck that airplane out of the sky and killed Rachel because she broke her covenants to me. Mm -hmm. And he did it so I wouldn't have to. Mm, my goodness. We were raised continually on the blood covenants mm -hmm. that if we did not live plural marriage, we would suffer eternal damnation. Right. And the only way that we could be saved was by blood atonement, our blood. Jesus Christ didn't die for our sins. We had to die for our own. And the worst sin yeah. you could commit yeah. was not believing in polygamy after it had been told to you. After it had been told to you, you were worse than somebody that never heard it. You That's were right. That's totally, totally right. going to be damned forever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is how I was raised. And now you were raised in the AUB group with, with some filterings in of other groups as well. And I was raised in a Kingston group and we were taught exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. And we've talked about this earlier, that really um, the only difference in the groups is who the leader is of, of where you're at. Because they, and yet they all say they are the only true group. That's but correct. it's all the same stuff. When I was approximately 15 years old, I was married. I say approximately because all of the birth certificates of my mother's children were forged. 
And I was told before I got married, taken in a little room and told, now listen. Actually, it was the back seat of a car, but that's a small room. <laughs> now listen, you have to live polygamy. It's a covenant you must do for your salvation. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you will suffer eternal damnation. Right. And if you turn away from the gospel now that it's been told to you, you're even worse off than you're, you never heard. You're worse than you ever could possibly be, and the only way you can be saved is by blood atonement. Your blood can be shed to save your soul. And, of course, we love you, and we do want to save your soul. Mm -hmm. But you have your free agency. You may choose. Define free agency. <laughs> my free agency was like holding a gun to my head and saying, hey, you can do what I say or I'll pull the trigger. Your choice. Mm -hmm. You choose which one you want. That was my free agency. Mm -hmm. There is no There's free no agency. There's no free agency. There those. is you, no free you agency. Don't. Well, a choice of one is no choice. When I got married, immediately I was pregnant. Okay, now he was how old and how old were you? I was allegedly 15. Mm, he was? He was 22. 22. He was 22. I was his first wife. I was property. Mm -hmm. I had a miscarriage almost immediately, got pregnant again. He was extremely overbearing. We were taught that abuse was not mental or emotional or psychological, that it had to be physical. If they didn't beat you, they didn't abuse you. Mm -hmm. He was extremely abusive. Yeah. He was condescending. He was cruel in everything that he said. He was demanding. He was arrogant. He was very unpleasant man to be around. And this is the man that I was married to. When I got pregnant, the second time, he would go out and bring girlfriends home that he was dating and have me serve them. And they would treat me condescendingly. And they didn't all, but his favorite ones did. And he would support that. And this is the joy of being a first wife. Well, and it's okay. the power. Yeah, it's the power and the control that a man has over the women in the yeah. groups. And he dated one woman who was very shy. And she wasn't a woman. She was a kid. They were all kids. Yeah. You know, 14, 15-year-old yeah. kids. Yeah. And one of them was very uncomfortable being there and very shy and was polite to me and a few years ago she ran into me and she's so glad to see me and she said I need to tell you something I've wanted to tell you all my life I never wanted to date your husband my father made me and I said I knew that I knew that from the beginning mm -hmm. and when my baby was born she wasn't very old when I felt like I had reached a point where I could not live with him, him anymore. It was just too difficult. When my baby would cry, he'd throw water in her face until she quit crying, and I was afraid he was going to drown her. Yeah. And he said, that's the way the babies have to be. You mm -hmm. do not have these large families and all these obedient children by accident. These children never cry in a meeting. They never cry. Anybody can tell you these children in polygamy are totally obedient, and this is how they start. Yeah. So he said, if you interfere, I'll keep throwing water in her face. And this was his M.O., how he mm -hmm. handled things. Mm -hmm. If he wanted yeah. to make me sad, it was threaten the baby. And, and we had talked about this water torture on babies in a couple of shows in the past. Right. So our viewers would be aware of, of this. As a, it was a standard procedure. It was a standard in procedure. In different groups. It was. So I went to my mother and I begged her to help me escape. I had some family in Idaho, and I thought maybe they'd treated me well. Maybe she could help me escape there, and I could keep my baby, and I could run. My mother was so terrified for what they might do to me if they caught me that she turned me in. Mm -hmm. And that's not unusual either. Yes. So she told me before she turned me in, she said, you are underage. If you run away, the law will bring you back to us. And we will give you back to your husband because you belong to him now. So don't try to run away. It'll only be worse. So when my husband found out, he took my baby away. She was less than three months old, still breastfeeding. He took her away. 
I tried to physically fight him, and he said, if you come near me again, this baby's going to be hurt. And remember, it's your fault. I was extremely devastated. And he said, incidentally, if you run away, the police will bring you back, mm -hmm. just like your mother said. It'll be worse for you than you can ever imagine. And he gave my baby mm -hmm. to one of his father's mentally ill wives. And the following weeks were the worst weeks of my life. How long were you without your baby? It was several weeks, about six weeks. Wow. And I prayed every day. I couldn't eat. Just that she would come home with all of her fingers and her toes and be okay. Was she okay when she got back? She was, and I literally fell on the floor and wept. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I imagine. But it scared me so mm -hmm. bad. I didn't know what to do. So I stuck around for five more children. And all of my children were girls. Mm. And with each baby. You knew the future of each one of those. With each you baby. Stayed. I hated myself. I had a little baby and I brought her into a world of slavery. Mm -hmm. And she would never be free. And I brought her into that world. And I would hold her and cry and think, what kind of a mother have you got, honey? And I made a promise. I would either get my children out, all of them, or I would die trying.